When considering a unit's performance, inherent details like base stats and growth rates are important, but a major contributor to a unit's performance is how the player uses them. This has become increasingly more relevant as Fire Emblem has incorporated reclassing, skills, and the performance warping emblems of Engage. The question that many players strive to answer is, what is a unit's best option? Or alternatively, what is the best unit for this build? This is definitely an interesting thought experiment, but it can stifle the creativity that comes from fully engaging with these systems. As such, I'd like to show off some non-standard builds that I've used in various playthroughs, demonstrating how there are many ways of using a unit to make them not just entertaining, but also high-performing under the context of one's personal goals. I'll detail what it took to get the build going, how I utilized the unit in my strategies once the build was complete, and offer some suggestions for potential improvements. That being said, let's warp on over to our first build. First up is Vantage Witch Nina from Fate's Conquest. Vantage Sorcerers are a popular build that stacks enough magical damage to be able to Oko enemies, always striking first with Vantage. There's a restriction in which units can even pull this off though, coming from needing a high magic stat and access to at least the Dark Mage and Samurai classes, with Diviner and or Wyvern Rider being appreciated for further damage stacking. Ophelia is the face of the build, having access to all of these traits with smart pairings, but I think it's interesting to consider what other options exist, which leads me to Nina. Her natural class access is Outlaw and Dark Mage, and her personal magic growth is just decent at 30%. As such, she's not an obvious fit for Advantage Sorcerer, but certain pairings give her just what she needs to pull through. With the Niles Nyx pairing, Nina inherits Diviner, for <laughs> reasons, along with a boosted magic growth, and by pairing her with either Korin or Kana, Nina gains access to Korin's talent, which in this case is Samurai. So with this setup, Nina now has access to everything she needs to sweep the game. I completed both the Kana and Nina paralogues after Chapter 15. This gave me plenty of time to have them reach their S support in time for the late game, but since there's a lot of reclassing that needs to be done to actually learn the necessary skills, I made sure to have a lot of paralogues available to speed up the process. Starting with the Mozu paralog, I immediately reclassed the level 17 Nina to Diviner, fighting most of the Faceless herself to build weapon rank, learning Magic Plus 2 along the way. Before Chapter 16, I went ahead and used all the Spear Dust on Nina, which in combination with the Fire Plus 3 I had forged for her, let her one round enemies right away. After a quick Chapter 16, Nina had already reached level 20 and was ready to promote. Omiyoji will eventually be useful for Tome Fair, but for the sake of seeing more combat, I opted for the bulkier Basara. With it, Nina got her fair share of kills in the Forest, Valoria, and Ophelia paralogues. Having also saved Invasion 1, Nina and Kana then unlocked their S support, and I reclassed Nina to Master of Arms at level 2. Through the Shigure paralog, I got Nina to level 5, earning herself advantage, while also getting seal strength out of the way. For Chapter 17, I reclassed Nina to Witch, finally ready to start sweeping enemies. Chapter 17 is typically tricky, but I'm glad to say that Vantage Nina was quite an effective solution. With all my magic stacking, she reached the Oko thresholds for the Master Ninjas, Mechanists, and Swordmasters, switching between the Calamity Gate and Fire Plus 3 depending on the matchup. One niche benefit of having Nina fulfill this role is that she naturally comes with Lock Touch and Movement Plus 1 meaning she was able to disarm traps herself and move forward at a fast pace. She essentially soloed the northern path, letting everyone else work together, setting up for a 15 turn clear where I got all the chests, saved Saizo, and routed. Since I wanted to, you know, train other units, I didn't always have Nina sweeping everything. Chapter 18, I just had her kill the generals in the center, and chapter 19, she got some offhanded kills against the Kitsune. She was absolutely a key contributor to my Chapter 20 clear though, in which Warp had some interesting interactions with the map layout and wind mechanic. I was able to blow her up to sweep some Omiyoji and Spearmasters in the northwest, then warp back to sweep the Great Master reinforcements in the south. By now, she needed a Fimbleveter plus 2 when the Calamity Gate or Forged Fire failed, but I found her hit rate to still be acceptable. 
Nina then warped back up north to assist in getting the final kills, and, for style points, warped onto the throne to seize. Chapter 21 was Warp's other shining moment, letting her follow Wyvern Lord Xander, Oakholing Stoneboard on player phase, and Faceless on enemy phase. This happened basically every turn, with copious Dragon Vein uses to keep Nina safe from the other Stoneborn. In the end, I got a 7 turn clear, deploying a full army that got sizable XP from routing most every enemy without Void Curse. I once again held Nina back a bit in Chapter 22, but warping between the sides was certainly useful, killing problematic enemies as necessary. Now, Chapter 23 was another big moment for Nina. After warping to protect Niles from the Spearmasters guarding the famous Master of Arms rally bot, Nina reached level 13 and was ready to reclass to Omiyoji. Warping back to the south, Nina took out the enemies at the forts, learning Tomefair at level 15, just in time to also sweep the enemies waiting at the other end of the stairs. She then reclassed back to Master of Arms, getting the singular level needed to learn life and death, before, yet again, warping to the throne to seize. With both Tomefair and life and death in her skill set, she was set to absolutely crush the enemies in the Midori Paralogue, and she was even able to reclass to Basara for Chapter 24, earning her Quixotic after sweeping Setsuna's group. Afterwards, she reclassed back to Witch, and swept the Northwestern Falconites with the Calamity Gate, reaching Azama by turn 4. After a few turns of fighting Hinoka's group, I was able to seize by turn 8, with the rest of the army being available to route the rest of the map. For Chapter 25, Nina's high speed proved to be quite useful, giving her a push in a void needed to consistently dodge spy shurikens with the Calamity Gate equipped. Of course, okoing the Master Ninjas and Master of Arms that she counterattacked. The Spy Shurikens made it take a little longer than expected to move forward, but Nina was still able to reach Kagero by the time the rest of the army reached Saizo, opening the Eastern Chest herself before Korin got the Ryoma kill on turn 13. Chapter 26 was pretty insane, as I chose to take the Monster Room path. Nina busted down the door, setting up Silas to run in and kill one of the Stoneborn. Silas himself had a strong vantage build, and the remaining Stoneborn didn't land enough attacks to either kill Silas or Nina, so the two were able to safely sweep the Faceless and get the remaining Stoneborn kills on player phase. The two handled the reinforcements in the same tag team manner, while the rest of the army was free to push towards Iago. As one final challenge before endgame, I took on the Siegbert Paralogue, in which Nina used her Master Ninja sweeping powers from before to clear out the Eastern Path that typically causes a lot of problems. Chapter 27 was pretty simple, with Nina taking on the Swordmasters. Something I'll note is that apparently, Nina's Daydream skill activates when any male units are paired up adjacent to her, including enemies. <laughs> Interesting. This isn't the last we'll see of this, though, because after some classic rescue usage, I get Nina down to Takami in Endgame, Turn 1, in which we see that Takami and his replica also trigger Daydream. <laughs> yeah, so... Moving on, Nina gets the 3-shot with a lightning plus 1, and the run is complete. Her final battle victory count pales in comparison to when I'd advantage Sorcerer Odin, but all in all, she was incredibly useful in achieving my goals of minimizing turns while also accomplishing completionist goals, like training a full team and getting all side objectives. I'm honestly pretty satisfied with the class pathing that I took her through, letting her have strong contributions right away from Chapter 16, and only having a handful of turns where she had to get kills in Master of Arms. My main concern with her was deciding on which tome to forge, as perhaps going all in on either one really strong fire or Fimbleventer could have been more worth than a decently forged version of each. Also, I don't have a record of her stats at every level, but I believe she was slightly above average on magic for a few chapters, in which case focusing on a higher Fimbleventer forge might be necessary. And lastly, she doesn't strictly need Witch, as she can have essentially the same combat performance in Sorcerer. Warp opened up some interesting strategies for quickly clearing out many sections of the map, but if you're willing to go a bit slower or just rush the victory conditions, then Sorcerer could work just as well. Oh, and if you choose to rescue skip endgame, maybe just consider having Nina attack Takumi at 2 range, so we don't have to think about any daydream implications. Time to shake things up. I know just the thing. Can't do the job without the duds. <sighs> Next up, we have Tank Oko Happy from Three Houses. While a lot of the Three Houses cast struggles to truly stand out in the face of the free reclassing system, 
Happy opens up some unique strategies, thanks to her personal skill, Monstrous Appeal. This gives her the benefit of constant monster effectivity at the cost of always being targeted by monsters, who would destroy her in her standard mage path. However, we don't have to go the standard frail mage utility path. What if instead we built Happy to have a strong enemy phase that lets her not just sweep large groups of human enemies, but also survive the monsters that she's drawing aggro from? Many enemy phase builds rely on killing their target before they get a chance to attack, which has its issues when monsters are put in the mix, with their high HP and damage reducing barriers. One build that can avoid this issue is a dodge tank, which I actually have done with Happy before as a wyvern lord, but this had the downsides of losing spell access and spending her player phase action to activate alert stance plus. And so I present to you an alternative. Defense stacking Happy so she tanks every enemy, while also magic stacking so she maintains productive enemy phases. To do this, we will need Happy to certify for Gremory, Dark Knight, and Great Knight. And of course, it couldn't hurt to get a faith for warp while we're at it. Unlike Nina, we get Happy really early in the run, joining as early as Chapter 2. This is good because there are a lot of skill ranks that Happy needs to reach her goals, and while we'll eventually need to do some auxiliary battles to meet the most egregious thresholds, I still found it an interesting challenge to get Happy as much progress as possible during chapter battles. I made her one of the early game units that I kept ahead of the curve, reaching level 5 in chapter 2, getting Arbor Knight bases for chapter 5, and oftentimes giving her the Thursis to ensure she could continue to get kills while being trained through Mage. Once she reached level 20, she was one of the leading forces in pushing forward as a Valkyrie, having particularly strong contributions in the monstrous Chapter 9, where I always give myself the additional challenge of performing a barrier break on every monster. After the time skip, I had gotten happy enough skill points to certify for Fortress Knight, raising her defense up to 17, then used all the giant shells in Ambrosia to further push her defense as high as possible. Within the following weeks, she also certified for Great Knight, Gremory, and Dark Knight. Now, you could certainly find ways for Happy to contribute to your strategies as is, but since I wanted to have the Tank Oko build available for as long as possible, I went ahead and did a couple auxiliary battles to speed up the process of mastering classes, but I did so in a way that minimized the turns spent given my goal. For example, to master Great Knight, I had Happy fighting against a horde of archers, applying Impregnable Wall and Retribution so that she would always counterattack but never get a kill, ensuring she would always get at least 6 rounds of combat per turn clutching out the mastery in just 10 turns. As for Gremory, I made a setup against four sword masters on the beach, just barely tanking with the Aegis shield and her newly learned Defiant Defense. She finished mastering Gremory in a quick clear of Chapter 15, and then pivoted back to Dark Knight, tanking the magical golems of the Rhea Paralog. With the Rhea Paralog complete, we then get the Sarah shield, which halves damage coming from monsters. Using the shield, Happy is then able to be the leading force of the Marianne Paralog, drawing the attention of every monster coming from the fog, taking minimal damage and getting healed back up from the Sarah Shield and Renewal. All the while, her monster effectivity ensured I was able to perform a barrier break for every enemy, and she ended up killing three of the boss's four health bars. And now, here comes Happy's big moment. After setting up both Defiant Defense and Defiant Magic at the start of Caspar and Mercedes' Paralog, Dark Knight Happy runs east, tanking the heroes and snipers, okoing on the counterattack. In doing so, the rest of the army is free to team up on the middle and western areas, with Happy even being competent in fighting the following monster completely on her own. As another monster-centric map, Leonie and Linhart's Paralog has us fighting the Immovable, in which Happy's naturally high res lets her tank the boss, making their crest effect and high crit chance irrelevant. For Grander Field, Happy actually switched to Great Knight, foregoing spell access for the greater bulk while maintaining high magical damage output with the Crusher. In doing so, she was able to sweep the right side, shrugging off attacks from the monsters and dealing solid damage on the counterattack with the Bolt Axe. Chapter 18, Happy saw a similar performance as in the Marianne Paralog, leading the charge against a ton of monsters, keeping everyone else safe while tanking with the Sarah Shield. As her final epic moment, I set up Happy to sweep the northeastern corner of Chapter 19, this time in Gremory, for the higher damage output and spell charges, setting up for Defiant skills and warping her forward turn 1. With the Gambit to mitigate enemy Gambits and lower Oko thresholds, she was set to tank the Heroes, Snipers, and Fortress Knights, netting several kills for herself with Banshee. The rest of the army was productive in sweeping other sections of the map, setting up for a mostly routed Chapter 19 in two turns. Unfortunately, Happy's contributions were limited for the final sequence of maps, 
But in the end, she got enough levels to reach the magic threshold to get an 11 range warp, which was necessary for an entertaining one turn clear of Azure Moon's endgame. Sure, I could have just reset for premium magic herbs instead of Ambrosia to get the same result, but in putting together this build, I also got a strong contributor to many clears that combined minimizing turn counts with my completionist goals, so I'm satisfied nonetheless. As for how the build might be improved, I would probably just consider ahead of time if there are any other enemy groups that have reasonable tanking and Oko thresholds. For as awesome as the build was, it is by far the most amount of attention that I've given to a unit, and I just wish she had more moments where it could shine. I also might suggest that you don't need to get a faith for warp, and honestly, you could probably just forego Gremory altogether if you just wanted a tanky happy that naturally draws monster attacks while tanking large groups of enemies. Killing on the counterattack was useful in achieving my goals of clearing many enemies in minimal turns, but like with Nina, the build could be made less extreme if you don't mind playing slower, or having some of your army tailing happy to finish off kills that she sets up. And now, I present to you the final build. Hortensia is widely known for filling a utility role, which makes sense considering her unit design. Her personal skill increases staff range by 1, her personal classes skill can save staff uses, and she trades relatively low magic for high dex and luck, in which the latter gives her an extremely high chance to trigger Divine Pulse to ensure landing offensive saves all the way through endgame. These are all great features, but I would like to take this moment to highlight Hortensia's combat prowess. There are only two other units with flying tome access. One actually has a similar stat spread of high speed, vaguely high magic, but she doesn't have staves. Ivy, on the other hand, is an interesting foil to Hortensia, with high magic, decent speed, and particularly low dex and luck. S Tomes also lets her wield tomes like Bulganon, while Hortensia is stuck with Elfire. What I'll propose is that if you can get Hortensia to reach the offensive thresholds that you want from a flying magical sweeper, then she has some niche benefits that sets her apart from Ivy. Alternatively, you could train both, and have two strong flying combat units. The question stands though, what would it take to get Hortensia to reach such offensive heights? Joining after chapter 14, her damage output is somewhat lacking at base, but like all units in Engage, she has many options that can boost her damage output. She's essentially already set to start sweeping, just needing a couple slight pushes. Through the Lin and Corrin paralogs, I got her a couple levels, earning an additional point or so in magic and speed. In doing so, I also unlocked Corrin's bond ranks past level 10, meaning I was able to provide an additional plus 3 magic by equipping Corrin to Hortensia, rather than plus 2. With this stat boost, a promotion to Slipnir Rider, an Elfire plus 3, Instruct Spectrum, and a Magic Tonic, I was set to have Hortensia sweep the Ike paralog. With Chloe providing bonded shield support, Hortensia was able to kill basically the entire right side of the map turn 1, then got danced over to sweep the left side turn 2. I took some extra turns to let the rest of my army clear out the rest of the map, with Hortensia freezing Ike in place thanks to Corrin's dreadful aura. In just a few paralogs, I got Hortensia to be a strong contributor in my goals of quickly clearing out large sections of the map, with the levels that she got in the process helping her keep up with one-round thresholds in the future. Chapter 16 was a great moment to show off the benefits of having a strong flying combat unit with staff access. Though the Shoals attempt to halt your progress, I was able to push past them turn 1, with Hortensia rescuing Elir Ford, setting up for a goddess dance that got Hortensia to immediately sweep the southern mage knights and royal knight. From there, she continued pushing forward in the south, reaching Mavia around the time the center group reached Marnie, tanking the flame lance quite well. Now, Hortensia's biggest issue in keeping up with one rounds is damage, made especially tricky due to the lack of cheap damage boosting for tomes, but I may do with Gentility, which turns into Bravery when Erika switches to Ephraim, increasing damage by 3. With this new boost, I once again just barely got Hortensia to reach the one round thresholds for Chapter 17. Because I did though, I was able to have her rescue units past the restrictive terrain, setting up for a turn 1 goddess dance that immediately pushed her in the middle of battle to 
taking advantage of the Vein of Secure to clear the flames. By now, I switched my Lucina user to be Rosado, whose hit boosting support complements Hortensia's avoid boosting support, in which Rosado further boosts Hortensia's already high hit rates, while Hortensia gives Rosado a push in discouraging enemies from attacking him. With this setup, Hortensia was able to kill the entire Mavia cavalry turn 1, going on to kill some of Marnie's group while the rest of the army moved forward. Because she had Corrin, she was able to freeze the bosses in place as they approached, making for a pretty tense few final turns, where the enemies all surrounded my army in the middle, but I was able to push through and get an atron clear while fully routing. The Byleth Paralogue was a very interesting experience, having her fly up to the boss group and freeze them in place, letting the rest of my army approach before he even had a chance to move, which is typically a frustrating aspect of the map. Chapter 18, Hortensia once again busted out the rescue staff, assisting in a one turn in which I got both chests and killed the recruitable character. From there, I realized her speed was starting to fall short a little. I could have done the leaf paralogue to get a speed wing for her, but I opted for speed plus two instead, taking place of Cantor. Another curious change was forging an L Surge, whose extra might was necessary, with being locked to one range not actually being a big deal for the upcoming map, Chapter 19. Like Chapter 17, I set up a big turn 1, utilizing Rescue and the Vein of Succor, getting Hortensia set up to sweep a ton of enemies turn 1. This got Mavier to rescue Marnie Ford immediately, and with Corrin, Hortensia was able to freeze both of them long enough to let some other units approach. Ultimately, I was able to get a 4 turn clear, in which I got the rewards from both villages and mostly routed. For the Sigurd Paralogue, I held back Hortensia in the beginning, but I had her up front when it came time to fight Sigurd, sweeping the generals and great knights when players would typically just kill Sigurd to end the map. For the Micaiah Paralogue, I had Hortensia bust out the El Surge again, sweeping the enemies to the west of Micaiah, with the Paladins and assorted infantry units being locked to one range. Jumping to Chapter 21, Hortensia once again got pushed far forward turn 1 with Dancing and Goddess Dancing, using Rescue to help Rosado keep up. In doing so, she was able to sweep the Bow Knights immediately, then use her huge res to bait Gris's group, then take on the boss group, freezing enemies with Corrin while the rest of the army approached. With no bonded shield, Chapter 22 did not feature a Hortensia sweep, but she was still able to get plenty of player phase kills, flying over the terrain and sniping enemies with Dire Thunder. I also had her spam Rescue, letting units move forward to kill an enemy, then get rescued back to stay safe. With all the emblems under our control, I occasionally opted for Salika over Corrin for the late game, with the extra push and damage being necessary to keep up with some one rounds. I didn't set up a bonded shield sweep for her in the Roy paralogue, but I did for the Marth paralogue, killing all the generals and snipers in the boss room turn 1. This was one map where Salika was not needed, so Hortensia was able to freeze the boss group for a turn, letting Citrine finish her vantage sweep in the west, and setting up for a turn 3 victory. The Aaliyah Paralogue saw some offhanded bonded shield sweeps on the west side of the map, clearing out the Halberdiers and Bow Knights, letting the rest of the army spread out, ultimately getting a 10 turn clear. For Chapter 22, Hortensia again swept the west side of the map, along with the Wyverns flying over the lava pit in the center. I even found a moment where Fortify was useful, and while such a scenario is definitely rare, it's an option unique to Hortensia as a flying tome sweeper. Now, I did decide to rework skip chapter 24 and 25, but Hortensia's flying rescue and strong magical combat let me also snag the Ukunvasara. Hortensia just provided a warp in chapter 25, but her contributions in chapter 24 lived on as I took out Lumera's final health bar with an Ukunvasara Oko. As Hortensia's final hurrah, she swept the enemies in the east side of chapter 26, quickly taking out the northeastern boss, setting up the rest of the army to defeat Sombron all in one turn. In the end, her battle victory count was much lower than I was expecting, but I was still very satisfied with the strength of her contributions. Sure, you could have Ivy perform a similar role, but Hortensia has some niche benefits. As I demonstrated, there are a lot of interesting strategies that involve the lead combat unit rescuing other units forward after being pushed forward themselves, and Hortensia allows you to save some rescue uses. Rather than using emblems and engraves to support her hit rates and speed, she used emblems and engraves to support her damage, and her high luck means she never has to worry about offhanded crits. I understand that I am not the first player to have Hortensia perform a combat role, but I still feel it was a worthwhile demonstration, considering how often she gets tied with Micaiah and having a purely utility-focused role. As for improvements, I think that, like Nina, 
planning out her forges ahead of time would be a worthwhile consideration, as perhaps focusing on the maxed forge Elfire would have mitigated the need to switch between Elfire and El Surge. I would also consider whether Hortensia reaches the same one round thresholds on fixed mode, as my Hortensia was playing with random growths thanks to that one update. I generally calculated her to be around average, if not a bit below, and if you know what thresholds she needs to reach ahead of time, you could save an additional Spirit Dust and Speedwing. It's not like using these resources is unreasonable, though, considering that the resulting units is set to sweep basically the entire game past Chapter 15, with unique staff utility as a nice bonus. And that's it for now. Hopefully, I was able to demonstrate that by looking past the most standard builds and units, there are some truly great options out there that can be not just entertaining, but also have strong contributions to whatever goals you set out for yourself. These are hardly the only non-standard options I've utilized, and if you're interested in seeing how I got something like Berserker Azura or Dark Knight Ignatz to have among the highest performance in my team, let me know. I'm also very interested to hear what options you've experimented with. I know there are a lot of creative minds out there, and I'd love for your voices to be heard. As always, if you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing so you don't miss out on future long-form content such as this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.